this discussion will cover the society of colonial Latin America. The colonies in Latin America changed culturally because of religion, they changed economically and politically, but also society changed dramatically in terms of social structure. The migration to Latin America in the 1600s and in the 1500s and 1600s was mainly men. And so they had relations with indigenous women. Sometimes it was consensual, many times it wasn't consensual. But what ended up happening then was a growing population of mestizos or people who were part Spanish and part indigenous. The social structure then in Latin America during the 300 years of the colonies was based on race. And so <clears throat> race was one of the most important deciding factors of a person's place in society. So there were different levels and the highest level would be the peninsulares or Spaniards born in Spain even if they were from a lower class. So the peninsulares comes from the word peninsula, the Spanish peninsula, Iberian peninsula. And then the next level of people were the Creoles. They were Spaniards but then they were born in Latin America. Now even though they were second to the peninsulares there were lots of stereotypes about them as being lazy, as being not very bright, and so a lot of negative stereotypes even though they were still on the second level. Next were mestizos. Uh, they were the mixture between indigenous and Spanish and they were usually merchants, artisans, domestics, laborers, but there was still a lot of racism against them. Then we have mulatto, which would be a mixture of Spanish and African because of slavery. Uh, indigenous uh, were looked down upon by Spaniards as lazy and stupid also. You can see the stereotypes seem to be the same. If one is stereotyping someone uh, different from themselves. These were basically the manual laborers in the society. And then at the bottom of the list were African slaves. So you can see that this list here shows all the different permutations and names of the children of mixed parents. So when you see that there are so many specific names for each different permutation, that shows you that race was really, really important in that society. So people understood there were like between 16 to 32 different permutations of race. So people were very specific. Now obviously one couldn't be specific with race because it's not a specific issue. Not that, my phone was ringing. I had to turn my phone off. So where was I? Okay, so <clears throat> 16 to 32 different permutations of race. So race was really important in terms of where people put each other in the social hierarchy. Even though race is kind of a, a made-up idea, especially when there's so much mixture among people, but there was still this idea. So this is a really famous set of paintings and each different painting demonstrates mixed parentage and names for them. So it was very important, it was put down on paper and people seem to have uh, strong ideas about it. What's interesting when you look at this you can see that each person is dressed in a little bit different way. So there were these stereotypes not only of people by race but what helped the stereotype was how they dressed. So that's an interesting thing to think about as well. Here we have a close-up 
of what looks to be a Spaniard and an African mulatto and Spanish and in India mestizo and Spanish castizo Spanish and castiza Spanish so here you see that someone uh, a castiza, someone who is almost completely Spanish, and a Spaniard, and their baby is considered Spanish. Black and Spanish, mulatto. So this quasi-caste system was pretty strict in terms of what it allowed people to do, the kinds of jobs they could have, that sort of thing. However, there were exceptions. One of the exceptions was money. If someone made a lot of money, Interestingly, all of a sudden, their skin became lighter. So people could buy from the crown certificates of race if you had enough money. So even if you were, say, indigenous, but you had a lot of money, you could buy a certificate that said that you were Spanish. So money mitigated this racial hierarchy. The other thing is that if someone had very light skin, perhaps they were mestizo, but they were very, very light-skinned, and so they could, quote, pass as a Spaniard. So here we have a picture of the social hierarchy. So we have <clears throat> peninsulares. These are people born in Spain at the top. Criollos or Creoles, descendants of peninsulares. In other words, their parents were born in Spain, but they had both Spanish parents, mother and father, but they were born in Latin America. Mestizos, Indian and Spanish, mulatos, Spanish and African, Native Americans and African slaves. So by 1789, towards the end of the colonial period, you see the percentage of different races. There were peninsulares and creoles were about 23%. You've got indigenous at almost 56%, uh, mestizos, mulatos, Africans making up a smaller. So <clears throat> many of the Spaniards who came to Latin America had been working class people in Spain. In other words, not very rich. Because if you were rich, why would you migrate to a world that you knew nothing about? The trip was very dangerous. The living was dangerous there. So really the people who were doing really well in Spain, they had no reason to leave. So it was people who had, you know, kind of a hard lot in life that thought, okay, I'm gonna go and try to make some money here. Some of them did became, become wealthy, some of them didn't. Um, but the peninsulares, the people who came over who had been born in Spain, were able to be appointed to high government positions. Whereas the Creoles and Mestizos, and of course indigenous and black, were not. Another part of the social hierarchy was gender, in addition to race. So colonial society was patriarchal, although <coughs> many peninsulari or Creole women who were widows remained widows so they could amass large estates. So, for example, only 44% of adult women were married in Mexico City in, in the 18th century. In other words, the rest of them were widows or perhaps not married, but that shows you that there were a lot of widows. So the laws were such that a widow could do, could do pretty well, and so they wanted to remain a widow rather than turning all of their uh, goods and wealth over to someone if they got married to them. A second way to maintain some independence for women was to become a nun. You know, we have these stereotypes of women becoming nun that is a very cloistered life and that it's, you know, um, not very uh, fun, it's, it's very dry, but actually becoming a nun was a very viable option for a woman who didn't want to marry. Nuns could be educated, 
they spent their time uh, reading, they could become artists. There were lots of different opportunities for women who were nuns that weren't available to women who got married. Now, Mestiza women, they also had some economic independence because <clears throat> they were street vendors, maids, cooks, small business owners. In other words, they had some economic viability. Um, indigenous women, though, were mainly rural, and when they moved to the city, they ended up becoming domestics. So they didn't have very much power, didn't have very much, didn't have very much money. So what we see in terms of the social structure, we see race, very important, and all of the different permutations of race and what race meant in terms of what jobs you could have. And we also see gender. So these were the two ways that uh, the society was set up in colonial Latin America. So one of the things to keep in mind is when you look at the different uh, areas of colonization that you will after we do Latin America, think about how was the social structure set up in those areas, in those colonial areas? Was it similar? Was it different? <laughs>